Recording in progress. Good morning. The 132nd meeting of the Presbytery of Western North Carolina will now come to work. I am going to convene us with a prayer of invocation, if you will join me. Gracious God, mm. thank you for the faithful servants gathered at this meeting. Where would we go? Give us wisdom to walk the path before. I have to go out and come back in. I guess what does it say? As we the work top together left to fulfill. I'm sorry. I'll start over. Gracious God, thank you for the faithful servants gathered today in this meeting. Give us wisdom to walk the path set before us. As we work together to fulfill your purpose, we commit to walk in grace humility, and truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, good morning. I'll try to speak up. Can you all hear me better? Um, I'm glad to be with you this morning, and I'm going to start with our land acknowledgement. Um, the General Council has adopted a motion that we begin our meetings with an acknowledgement of some of the traditional Native inhabitants of the land in which we live and minister. The indigenous peoples of the Americas are the inhabitants of the Americas before the arrival of the European settlers in the 15th century, and the ethnic groups who now identify themselves with these peoples. By so doing, we offer recognition and respect and seek to cultivate a deeper awareness of the history that has led to the present moment. And we invite reflection on the responsibilities as descendants of that history. Today, we continue our acknowledgement by specifically remembering that we live, worship, and serve in the region of the native lands of the Catawba, Sugary, and Cherokee peoples, among others, paying our respects to elders of the past and present, known and unknown. Let us do our faithful work mindful of them. The following will serve as hosts and co-hosts in our Zoom meeting this morning, helping us with technical matters. Marie Palacios, John P., Bob Forsyth, and Cam Murchison. And we thank them for doing this for us. I'd also like to mention that Keith Thompson, the pastor of Brevard Davidson River Presbyterian Church, will lead the prayers of intercession later this morning. Some prayers have already been sent for inclusion uh, if anyone wants to send additional ones, please provide to the stated clerk via email at cmurk1 at gmail.com. That's C-M-U-R-C, the number one, at gmail.com, no later than 1015. You can also send a chat directly through the Zoom feature to CAM. But again, please send any prayers of intercession to CAM by 1015. Thanks to Bob Abel for agreeing to prepare the Presbyterian brief for distribution to our churches a few days following this meeting. I'd like to remind everyone that the Lord's Supper will be celebrated in the worship service this morning, and all should take a minute before the service begins to gather elements that may serve as bread and cup so that all may partake as the worship leaders serve one another. At this time, I'd like to ask um, any folks visiting with us to uh, unmute themselves and be recognized. And I'm gonna start by inviting any ruling elders who are attending a meeting of this presbytery of Western North Carolina for the first time. Again, just folks who are here for the first time. If you would please unmute and introduce yourself and identify the church from which you come. I'm Leslie Nissen, and I'm coming from Trinity Presbyterian Church in Hendersonville, North Carolina. I'm Gay Ferguson, and I'm from Black Mountain, North Carolina, Black Mountain Presbyterian. 
I'm Maggie McKinney from First Presbyterian in Morganton. I'm David Nolan from Silva Presbyterian Church. Frank Porter from Davis River Presbyterian. I'm Martha Sutton from Grace Covenant Presbyterian in Asheville. Jeannie Harden from Mills River Presbyterian Church in Mills River. I'm Marie Cook from Cross North Presbyterian in Cross North, North Carolina. Uh, Steve Culp from Trinity Presbyterian, Hendersonville. Mickey Terry. Argo, First Presbyterian Church, Asheville. Terry Evans. Ed McDaniel, First Presbyterian Church, Morganton. Ginger Sermons, Northminster Presbyterian Church, Hickory, North Carolina. Donna Ensley, Donna Ensley, First Presbyterian Church, Asheville, North Carolina. Terry Taylor, Third Street Presbyterian Church, Gastonia, North Carolina. Carolyn Works, Third Street Presbyterian Church, North Carolina. Terry Appenzeller, First Presbyterian Church, Hickory. Thank you all. We're glad that you are with us. Um, next, I invite any corresponding members. These are visitors who are part of another presbytery or synod or other entity of the PCUSA. If any are among us, would you please unmute and introduce yourself and indicate from which council or entity of the Presbyterian Church you come from? Hi, my name is Richard Floyd. I'm uh, coming from Greater Atlanta Presbytery. My name is Rachel Shepard. Uh, I'm a member of Presbytery at the Peaks. Welcome, we're glad you're with us. Um, at this time, I'm going to uh, ask our stated clerk to provide us with a brief orientation for our meeting. One moment. I'll do that better if I'm unmuted, correct? The, the host will keep all of us uh, muted except when we're called upon to speak. Uh, the orientation is fairly simple for the day. Uh, anyone who is preparing to speak, uh, including myself, must first unmute themselves. Should the need for a counted vote arise during the meeting, we'll provide specific instruction for that at the time the vote is needed rather than taking time to do that now. On a computer or a mobile device, you will need to raise your hand for recognition in this meeting from time to time. And on the computer, you can usually find a raise hand icon at the bottom of your screen. If it's not immediately visible, you can look for a, a button that says reactions and you may find it beneath that button. Alternatively, you can look on the participants list and see if it gives you an opportunity to, to raise your hand. If you're on a traditional telephone or a telephone of any kind, just press star nine and that will give the raise hand icon so we can, you can be recognized. The moderator will always invite anyone who has tried unsuccessfully to raise a hand to simply unmute themselves and ask for uh, opportunity to speak to whatever the issue before us may be at the time. Uh, if there are any particular questions anyone has about any of this, uh, about the use of Zoom, they would like to ask before we get started, please unmute yourself and ask that question at this point in time. Um, I, 
Go ahead. I'm Ron Keebler. I'm uh, asking a question. Uh, I'm not sure if this is the right venue to bring it up. I put a question in chat. The uh, First Presbyterian Church of Hendersonville is not listed on attachment one and two, pages 14 and 17, among all the other Presbyterian churches. And I was curious why, why not? Um, let me take a quick look at that with you, if I can. Uh, what pages did you say it was on? Pages 14 and 17. So that'd be attachment one and attachment two. You have Hendersonville uh, Church, but uh, we are a first Presbyterian church of Hendersonville. Yeah, Ron, th these are uh, terms of call uh, reports, I believe. Is that correct? Uh, and if a church isn't listed, it, it's, it, it simply means that we haven't received a report. Uh, and in this case, most of these reports pertain to installed pastors rather than stated pastors, which you've had it at um, First Church Hendersonville. So that probably explains the absence, but, it, but it's not a complete report and other reports are, will be anticipated uh, before the end of, by the next meeting. So it should be caught up by that point in time. Thank you. Madam Moderator, I think if there are no other questions about the orientation, we can proceed. Thank you, Cam. Um, Mr. Clerk, is there a quorum present? Uh, by the standing rules, we need at least 50 commissioners with 20 teaching elders and 20 ruling elders coming from at least 20 sessions. At this very red hot moment, we appear to have 132 people in the meeting. And by the, these criteria, there does appear to be a quorum present. Thank you. If I can proceed with the docket, uh, I move the approval of the docket as presented on pages three and four in the packet for the meeting. This comes to us from a committee, so no second is required. And you have heard the motion to approve the docket. Is there any objection? Again, if you raise your hand, it shows up on Zoom and I'll know that you have an objection. Oh, no. um, if you have an objection, you can unmute yourself. Seeing no objection, I declare the motion adopted by common consent. Cam, are we ready to proceed to the consent agenda? We indeed are, and I will move the consent agenda at, on behalf of general counsel as presented on pages 10 through 11 of the packet for this meeting. Again, the consent agenda is on pages 10 to 11. Uh, it, this uh, recommendation, to, the motion to approve comes to us from a committee. No second is required. You have heard the motion, it's on your screen. Does anyone wish to remove any item from the consent agenda? I'm not seeing any hands raised, but if you wish to remove any item from the consent agenda, you may unmute yourself and identify the item to be removed. I am not seeing any um, suggestion that any items be removed. And so the consent agenda is before you in its entirety. Is there any objection to the motion to approve the consent agenda? Again, I'm looking for any raised hands on Zoom or you're welcome to unmute yourself if there's any objections. But seeing none, I declare the motion adopted by common consent. At this time, I will call on the stated clerk for his report, which is found on uh, beginning on page 12 of the packet for the meeting. At a moderator, that report does begin on page 12 and run through page 23. Uh, all of the recommendations in the report have been, just been dealt with in the consent agenda. Uh, therefore, 
uh, call attention to other items of information of the report, especially I want to call attention to the matter related to the sacred boundary training uh, on page 12 to the sessional record review process that's also on page 12, to the terms of call report that's involved there, and the Committee on Representation report that is on pages 21 through 23. These all deserve the attention of everybody in the Presbytery, and if there are no questions about any of that, um, this will conclude the report, but I stand ready to answer any questions that members may have. There's a lot of good information in these reports, and we thank Cam for pulling them together. I'm not seeing any questions for Cam. I would um, also call your attention to five reports that were submitted for information with your packets. And I, again, encourage you to read these carefully so that you can be fully informed about the work of the Presbytery. These are reports submitted for information. Um, there's one from the Missions Committee about the good work they are doing, another from the Peace and Justice Committee. There's a report from the Finance Committee, a report from the Building Hope Committee, and then there are reports from the commissioners who attended the 225th General Assembly. And so I commend those reports to you. At this time, I'm going to invite us to uh, move to worship. Um, we have a service prepared by John P. He's the commissioned pastor of Robinson Memorial Presbyterian Church in Gastonia. I'll remind you all to have your gathered elements to be used for communion this morning. Um, and I would also point you to the order of worship, which is on page nine of your packet. Um, as we participate in worship, the hymns and the prayers and the responses will be displayed on your screen. Um, last, I ask that everyone be sure they are muted as we join together in worship. Let us worship God. Does a longtime editor, newspaper journalist, dropped in the middle of a presbytery meeting, find himself now a cyberspace preacher to acquire a distinguished Bible teachers? But a hurricane came by the name of COVID-19 and it threw off our game, sent us all a scrambling. Yet gospel couldn't wait for us to beg, steal, or barter, so we got a lot smarter. Now each a self-starter, we busted out cameras connected to the net, reached out with computers, found a new outlet. Holy Spirit pushed us, pushed us to be better, reminding us Paul did it all in a letter. So then a call came asking for me by name. I think they must have hit the bottom of the drain. What words can I offer? Don't let me down brain. I'm not Lin-Manuel Miranda or even Mark Twain. Then I remember from where the first 12 came, fishermen, tax collectors, men of no fame, touched by the spirit, no reason for shame, commissioned for a season we've a gospel to proclaim. No, I'm not Alexander Hamilton. I'm what you might call a CRE. A million sermons I've yet to give. So if you hate this one, remember, we forgive. Oh, hi there. That's uh, enough of that. I reached, if not overreached, my limit. And I'm guessing your limit too. Since 1929, the face on our $10 bills has been Alexander Hamilton, the nation's first secretary of the treasury. A few years back, officials announced plans to replace Hamilton with a yet-to-be-named historical figure. Any such talk faded into the background after the musical play Hamilton exploded on the scene. 
capturing the hearts of theater goers and music lovers around the country. Beyond Hamilton's duel with Aaron Burr, I dare say most Americans had no idea who Hamilton really was or the details of his story. They rather do now. The final number of the musical Hamilton is titled, Who Lives, Who Dies, Who Tells Your Story? Posing the question of, when we die, who will remember us? We won't be in control of that. And when you're gone, who remembers your name? Who keeps your flame? Who tells your story? Alexander Hamilton, you could say, remains on the $10 bill because his story was powerfully told. Not in a classroom lecture, but on a stage and with a beat. Fewer people each year populate our church pews. Fewer people hear the story of the triune God. Fewer people know the stories found in the Bible, and I dare say fewer understand the context of those stories. Who lives? Who dies? Who tells your story? The story of the world changed in 2020 courtesy of a tiny virus. We did the unthinkable. We shuttered churches for a time. The world was turned upside down. What did we learn, if anything? Have we changed, not the story, but how we tell it to the rising number of people who've never heard it? So, later on in this service, we'll be talking about who tells the story. Wait for it, because you're in the Zoom room where it will happen. Grace and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. Welcome to the worship service for the July 30th, 2022 meeting of the Presbytery of Western North Carolina. This is coming to you from Robinson Memorial Presbyterian Church in Gastonia. I am humbled by the invitation to lead our worship service today. Music will be provided by Robinson's musical director, Ashley Burke, but she'll only be providing the accompaniment. We invite you to provide the singing part. The lyrics will appear at the bottom of your screen, so no excuses for failing to sing along. We'll have our eyes on you. It's one of the side benefits of being a co-host for these Zoom meetings. You can see everything going on. And that includes you, Mark Stanley. Our eyes are on you. Following confession, the service will pause briefly when you will be invited to pass the peace among each other in a glorious cacophony of sharing. As you undoubtedly already know, we will be celebrating the Sacrament of Communion. We invite you to participate, so hopefully you have already prepared your own elements so that you don't miss a minute of this meeting. And there will be a quiz at the end, by the way. What comes next? We begin with our responsive call to worship. You'll find the words on your screen. Oh Lord, my heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. But I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. My soul, my soul is like is the weaned like child, the child that is with, that is me. with me. O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord from this time on and forevermore. Let us worship God. Our opening hymn for this service is titled, 
My faith looks up to thee. As we mentioned earlier, you'll find the lyrics at the bottom of your screen. Please sing along. Do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about this promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. With this in mind, let us confess our sins and seek redemption. Gracious, almighty God, forgive our ways. We cherish our status quo while ignoring Christ came into the world to disrupt our complacency. We lean too heavily on our inheritance as engrafted members of Abraham's line, failing to see how you continue prodding us to change and find new ways of glorifying your name and telling your story. Forgiver and cleanser, guide us so that we don't throw away our shot at doing your will. Help us satisfy our deepest desire to serve only you. Amen. From now on, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
now we pause. We unmute ourselves and pass the peace of Christ to each other. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. And also with you. Peace, peace, peace. Peace to everyone. See you. May the peace of Christ be with us all. Christ, everybody. Peace of Christ. And peace be with you. Christ. Peace be with you. And with you. Peace to all. our hearts with the peace of Christ. Grant us, Lord, open hearts and minds to hear and discern your word for us today. Indeed, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of all our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Our scripture reading for this service comes to us from the book of Acts. Chapter 26, verses 4 through 18. Listen now to the word of our Lord. All the Jews know my way of life from youth, a life spent from the beginning among my own people and in Jerusalem. They have known for a long time, if they are willing to testify, that I have belonged to the strictest sect of our religion and lived as a Pharisee. And now, I stand here on trial on account of my hope in the promise made by God to our ancestors, a promise that our twelve tribes hope to attain as they earnestly worship day and night. It is for this hope, Your Excellency, that I am accused by Jews. Why is it thought incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? Indeed, I myself was convinced that I ought to do many things against the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that is what I did in Jerusalem. With authority received from the chief priest, I not only locked up many of the saints in prison, but I also cast my vote against them when they were being condemned to death. By punishing them often in all the synagogues, I tried to force them to blaspheme. And since I was so furiously enraged at them, I pursued them even to foreign cities. With this in mind, I was traveling to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priest when at midday along the road, Your Excellency, I saw a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining around me and my companions. When we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? It hurts you to kick against the goads. I asked, Who are you, Lord? The Lord answered, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose to appoint you to serve and testify to the things in which you have seen me and to those in which I will appear to you. I will rescue you from your people and from the Gentiles, to whom I am sending you, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Many years ago, while attending my first 
editor's meeting for the newspaper chain I worked for, the executive editor of our largest paper remarked that unlike General Electric, which proudly proclaimed it brought good things to life, newspapers, by necessity, brought bad things to light. I think few people actually like reading about crime, government corruption, business and economic woes, pandemics, or about the family burned out of their home on Christmas Day. All bad news. Yet that was part of our mission, to truthfully cover and report on bad things. Why don't you ever report on good things? I heard that question more than once in my career. The truth is, many if not most journalists tire of covering bad news. And attacks on reporters seem to be getting steadily louder. But without dedicated journalists, who would tell the stories? Bad news is unwanted. Bad news makes some people angry. Bad news upsets the status quo. So why not kill the messenger, so to speak? That'll stop the bad news. Yet, one person's bad news is another's good news and vice versa. The Apostle Paul had once sought to snuff out the good news, persecuting the reporters who dared share the gospel with others. Of course, they weren't called reporters. They were witnesses, proclaimers of a story about a convicted, executed blasphemer who they claimed had been brought back to life by the Almighty. Nonsense. The powerful people in Jerusalem said. Fake news never happened. Their way of life was being threatened by this so-called good news. Their control over the message heard by the people was being challenged. <laughs> Bad news indeed. In our reading today, Paul is in the proverbial hot seat, facing Roman judgment for spreading the same good news he had earlier sought to squelch. For more than 20 years he had been traveling, telling the story of Christ to anyone who would listen. This is good news! God came into the world to be with us for a time, was crucified, and then resurrected paving the way for those with faith in God to join him in the resurrection. We have received an undeserved gift of grace. We are no longer prisoners of sin. Paul had been relentlessly telling this story, speaking and writing as if he was running out of time. Our text finds Paul telling this story to a new audience, specifically King Herod Agrippa II. Paul had been in Roman custody for a good while now in Caesarea, with the new Roman governor Festus unsure what to do with him. Festus was supposed to send him off to Caesar in Rome, but had no idea what charges to assign against him. He hoped Agrippa would have some idea of what the crime might be, having been around the Jewish people for much longer than he. So Paul tells a story to Agrippa, how he encountered Jesus on the road to Damascus and was charged to tell the story of Christ risen. I am sending you to open their eyes. Christ converted one of his strongest foes into one of the greatest 
tellers of the story. Who lives? Who dies? Who tells your story? As we know, that all happened centuries ago. Yet in no small part because of Paul, the story lives on. But for how much longer? Uh Uh-oh. Sounds like we're heading into the bad news territory, doesn't it? See if this story resonates with you. In 2019, the regular Sunday worship attendance here at Robinson Memorial averaged about 35 people, which for our size sanctuary was really pretty good. Then, due to COVID, For a little more than a year, our Sunday in-person attendance was, you guessed it, zero. Starting with Easter in 2021, we worshiped in person again, but the attendance numbers lagged badly from pre-pandemic levels, getting slightly worse with every new COVID-19 variant. Nowadays, if we have 20 people sitting in the pews, We call that a good Sunday. Granted, there is a whole host of reasons for this, including older congregates having gotten, well, older and sicker. For them, we still pre-record services for online and DVD use. Some of our folks also died. Others just got out of the habit of attending church every Sunday morning. Unlike smoking cigarettes, some habits are extremely easy to break and difficult to resume once broken. Ask the folks at Planet Fitness about that. So how do we turn old habits into new, better ones? We have an important story that needs to be told. The story. But where are the people? Pew Research found that in 2021, the percentage of Americans self-identifying as Christian had dropped to 63% compared to 75% just a decade ago. Our own denomination's self-reported statistics show a consistent, almost 60-year downward trend in membership. Most of us live in this reality. Well, down the street and around the corner from our church, a city park is packed on Sundays with baseball or soccer players and their parents. We know the problems. And the good news is we are not helpless. But the clock is going tick tock, so to speak. Just this past weekend, CBS Sunday Morning aired a report on the changing nature of public libraries. Libraries have experienced their own downward trend in terms of in-person visits. Yet, online borrowing increased sharply. And these were 2019 figures, pre-COVID. During the lockdowns, librarians took a hard look at their post-pandemic futures. How can they continue to be true to their mission and at the same time, find new ways to connect to people. The world changed, but their mission didn't. The church lives in that same changed world. Yet, have we as a denomination really taken a hard look at the future of our primary mission, telling the story? Our denomination puts a lot of effort into confronting the problems of society, and that is good. However, the recently concluded General Assembly spent 
countless hours debating big issues facing the world and the church. But here's one thing I didn't see. Any large chunk of time spent discussing new ways we can tell Christ's story in today's world. What part of our soon-to-be-increased per capita was earmarked to discovering and encouraging methods to reach new ears in a vastly changed world? How much effort are we devoting to explaining to others what being Christian means? Truth is, plenty of people are defining it as suits their purposes. See how the term evangelical has been hijacked to describe a political faction rather than a desire to spread the gospel. Some are filling arena-sized paces, telling stories of God who wants us all to be rich, comfortable, and happy here on earth. No worries, no troubles. You just have to believe and send in your dollars. That's what some people mistake as the gospel, making one's own earthly life better. Why are they doing that? Because those are the voices they are hearing. Well, our voices often seem to echo off the walls of our own sanctuaries and buildings. Some think off limits to them. The sad truth is those who make the most noise draw the most attention. While we say actions speak louder than words, if we don't also vocalize in ways people now consume information, using the media of today, what happens to the gospel? If the only message heard about Christianity above all the noise of the world is that God hates this and hates that and hates those people, that God is the exclusive deity of just one nation. If those are the only voices people can hear, that's what they will believe is Christianity. As a denomination, we spend lots of time talking about social justice, and that is important, but not as important as telling the story. First comes the gospel. It has to be that way, or otherwise the church is no more than a well-meaning club. When the people of Capernaum begged Jesus to stay and do more miracles, he said, no, I must proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God to other cities also, for I was sent for this purpose. First, tell the story. Then, do good works. So in my mind, we must reimagine the ways we tell it. For today's audiences, outside our church walls. If we don't, how can we expect people to know the Christ we do. In the absence of a clear, strong voice, others will fill the void. Who lives? Who dies? Who tells the story? As the average age of our church continues to rise, who will tell the story? What path we choose now matters. COVID changed the world. Is that a good or a bad thing? Maybe it is the wake-up call we needed. The push of the Holy Spirit to be less the frozen chosen and more those chosen to share the story in new, if not bold, ways. 
After all, if we don't tell it, as Paul well knew, you can be sure someone will tell a different story. Job number one, tell the story, the gospel. Reach out in ways we never anticipated. Will it be enough? Will the world ever be satisfied? That's where faith comes in, followed by action. Who lives? Who dies? Who will tell the story? Let's not throw away our shot. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In communion, we remember the story of the night Jesus broke bread and drank wine with his disciples. But we know communion is so much more. In this sacrament, we remember the new covenant Christ made with us. We invite the Holy Spirit to fill us anew as we partake of the elements from wherever we may be right now and look forward to that day when we gather with all the saints at the one table. How true the words we regularly say at communion, that they will come from north and south and east and west to take their places at the table. So I wonder how differently we might hear those words if we just add it in one word after each direction. Hemisphere. North Hemisphere, South Hemisphere, East Hemisphere, and West Hemisphere. It re might remind us that the story we have to tell is for all the world, all the people. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were open, and they recognized him. We pray for open eyes as we give thanks to Almighty God. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Blessed are you, strong and faithful God. All your works, the height and the depth, echo the silent music of your praise. In the beginning, your word summoned light. Night withdrew and creation dawned. As ages passed unseen, waters gathered on the face of the earth and life appeared. When the times at last had ripened and the earth grown full in abundance, you created in your image mankind, the stewards of all creation. You gave us breath and speech that all the living might find a voice to sing your praise and to celebrate the creation you call good. When our disobedience took us far from you. You did not abandon us to the power of death. In your mercy, you came to our help so that in seeking you, we might find you. Again and again, you called us into covenant with you. And through the prophets, you taught us to hope for salvation. Almighty God, you loved the world so much that in the fullness of time you sent your only Son to be our Savior. Incarnate by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, he lived as one of us, yet without sin. To the poor he proclaimed the good news of salvation. To prisoners, freedom. To the sorrowful, joy. To fulfill your purpose, 
he gave himself up to death and rising from the grave, destroyed death and made the whole creation new. And that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and rose for us, God sent the Holy Spirit, God's first gift for those who believe, to complete God's work in the world and to bring to fulfillment the sanctification of all. By the Holy Spirit, you lead us into all truth and give us power to proclaim your gospel to the nations and to serve you as your priestly people. Lord, we pray that in your goodness and mercy, your Holy Spirit may descend upon us and upon these gifts, sanctifying them and showing them to be holy gifts for your holy people. The bread of life and the cup of salvation, the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Grant that all who share this bread and this cup may become one body and one spirit, a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your name. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, all honor and glory are yours, Almighty God and Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. And we pray together the words you taught us, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his rest, took bread. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup. saying, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do this in remembrance of me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes. The gifts of God for the people of God. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven, the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. For our closing hymn, won't you join along in singing, Open My Eyes That I May See? Hey, Quetz, you're still preaching.
Thank you for your participation in today's worship. In a few moments, we'll be heading into small breakout groups during this Zoom meeting. We suggest using that time to share ideas on how we can tell the gospel story in new ways outside of our sanctuaries. Then, continue the conversation with the folks at your church and with leaders in the denomination. The world has its eyes on us. This is God's commandment, that we should believe in the name of Jesus Christ and love one another, just as He has commanded us. All who obey His commandments abide in Him, and He imbibes in them. And by this we know that He abides in us, by the Spirit that He has given us. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you, May he make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace now and forevermore. Amen. Many, many thanks to John P. for that uh, fabulous worship service. And thanks also to the musician, Ashley Burke. We are grateful uh, for the word you shared with us today. Um, before we move into breakout rooms, I want to circle back. Um, there may have been someone who had a question during the discussion of the consent agenda. I just want to acknowledge technology can be a little challenging and someone may have raised their hand and had a question and I didn't call on them. If you had a question about the consent agenda you still wish to ask, I invite you to unmute yourself. Okay. Um, at this time, we are going to go to breakout rooms. Um, this will be a chance for us to gather in small groups. Um, it will happen automatically and you will get a, a button that asks you to accept and you'll be sent to a breakout room. Um, I ask you to consider in your breakout room, um, as John P. asked us to do, um, to consider how during the course of the pandemic, uh, you and your church have considered new ways of reaching out with the gospel. And what you might have discovered, and which of these practices might continue. And I ask you to also consider how our presbytery might support these efforts. Um, at the end of the breakout sessions, if someone in each group could please share your ideas in the chat box, that way we can all um, see what others are talking about. So again, please be sure to accept the invitation that pops up on your screen to join a breakout room. And then after about eight minutes, we will return to be together. We'll take about 30 seconds to get us into the breakout rooms, if you'll bear with me. Thanks, Marie.
Is, is this our group? It looks like it. Or is, this is a small group. <laughs> Good morning, neighbor. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> How are you, Jeannie? Hey, doing well. Oh, looks like we're getting
progress. But you're, um, I, you. Um, I encourage I encourage you to bring that around to the list there uh, comments in the chat. Are you all hearing feedback? Yes, yes, we are. I don't know what to do about that. Feedback. I think it's better now, Sarah. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, um, okay. I'm still hearing an echo. Sarah, I believe you're showing something needs to be shut down. Yeah, the live stream, the live stream probably needs. Micah might be able to help us with that. Yeah, I don't know how to. I mean, they're they're nice. Okay, then we're gonna leave those. Yeah, I'm just, just gonna break this. I just have one screen up. It's not you, Sarah. It's it's the system. Don't worry about it. Okay, I'm just going to keep talking. Um, if your group had comments from the breakout room and you can add them to the chat box, that would be excellent. Um, at this time, I am going to call on Hal Bennett, the chair of general counsel to make its report. Thank you, Madam moderator. I would like to call the body's attention to the council report on pages 24 through 26. Particularly, I would like for the body to look at the single recommendation for action, the resolution of appreciation on page 26. Billy Robson is concluding his service as Associate Presbyterian Presbyterian of Western North Carolina. At this time, I would like to read the resolution that is found on page 26. Whereas the Reverend William Blount Robinson, AKA Billy Robinson, was nominated and elected at the meeting of the Presbyterian of Western North Carolina on October the 25th, 2016, as Associate Presbyterian for a mission witness and church support have served the Presbyterian with integrity, passion, and faithfulness. Whereas by providing support and leadership for the mission and outreach development division, Billy has evidenced and promoted a keen sense of the concerns of the peace and justice, hunger, and mission committees as they summon their presenter as a whole to this common work. Moreover, Billy has also supported the Malawi ministry team in that crucial aspect of our ministry, as well as champion the cause of campus ministry with special support for the board of UKIRT ministry at Western Carolina University. And whereas Billy has embraced major responsibilities in the Congregation Development Division by working effectively with the smaller membership churches and evangelism committee, helping them find effective ways to integrate their ministries to maximize their effectiveness. Additionally, he has undergirded the work of the Church Formation and Transformation Committee as it has sought to revitalize congregations of the Presbyterian and explore opportunities for developing new worshiping communities and new church development. And whereas beyond this work with the Presbyterian committees, Billy has given direct support and encouragement to many congregations 
within the Presbyterian, helping them to find needed pastoral leadership, exploring ways of sharing and managing ministries, imagining new ways in which they might undertake ministry, preaching the good news of God in their worship service, and simulating the resolution of difficulties arising from time to time. In all seasons, Billy has been a supportive pastoral presence to ministers, but especially amid the dislocation and disorientation caused by the pandemic. Therefore, be it hereby resolved that the General Council of the Presbyterian of Western North Carolina records its deep appreciation to Billy Robson for work well done and ministry faithfully carried out, expresses his confidence that the fruit of his labors will persist in the life and ministry of the Presbyterian, wishes him God's speed in the next chapter of his ministry, and invites the members of the Presbyterian meeting at its 132nd stated meeting on July the 30th, 2022, to join in this resolution of appreciation and gratitude. At this time, Madam Moderator, I move that the council, uh, that the Presbyterian join the council uh, by adopting this resolution as its own. Thank you, Hal. Uh, we are grateful for Billy and the work he did with us and for this resolution. And I ask if there's any objection from the body with us also adopting this resolution. Uh, hearing none, I invite us to respond to this motion by applauding, waving, or other gestures of enthusiastic endorsement. Thank you, Billy. Once again, Madam Moderator, I would like to call the body's attention to pages 24 and 25, the actions that the General Counsel on behalf of the Presbyterian have taken. I like to point out there have been some major allocations that have been proportioned of the receipts from the sale of church property for new church development and afforded housing. If there are no further questions, that concludes my report. Thank you, Hal. Are there any questions for Hal of this general counsel report? At this time then, I'm gonna move us on to a discussion, a report from the Guatemala Partnership. Um, and I call on Marie Palacios and Kevin Frederick to make the report for the Guatemala Partnership. Buenos dias. Good morning, all. Um, we have another person who will be joining us in this report today, and that will be Pastor um, Ellen Dozier. And we just are excited to be able to share a little bit about the Guatemala Partnership with you here today. So here's what we're going to share in a few minutes. A snapshot of the PWNC Guatemala Partnership, updates about a few special um, projects. We're going to share a few highlights from our May 2022 trip to Guatemala, and then some upcoming trips and engagement opportunities. I know that we probably won't have time on the docket for us to address individual questions. If we do, we'll certainly open the floor. But I invite you to enter any questions that hit your brain as we're going through today's information. Type it into the chat box and someone from the Guatemala Partnership team will respond to you within this coming week. So again, if something you have a question or you want to make a comment, please put those in the chat box. We will be looking for those and we'll respond accordingly. So one important thing to know is that we are celebrating 28 years of partnership in Guatemala, and we're looking ahead towards that 30 year milestone. And during the past almost three decades, we've seen thousands of children succeeding in school, thanks to our scholarship and education programs. Thousands of community members are healthier as a result of stove projects, filter projects, anti-parasitic nutrition clinics, all kinds of things there. We know that there are dozens of equipped pastors, lay pastors and church leaders, thanks to the support of theological education and through the partnership, hundreds of more stable families, thanks to programs like Microloan and Men in the Mirror, and thousands of lives transformed and enriched in both of um, North Carolina and Guatemala. 
So if you see or talk to anyone who's been to Guatemala, whether it be through a sister church visit or one of our delegation trips or for any other reason, you probably know that we tend to leave a part of our heart in Guatemala. If you have questions specifically about the partnership or the norms, I invite you to check out the Presbytery of North Carolina's, Western North Carolina's website. You will see on the screen the information to access our manual, our guidebook. If you don't remember this or you don't have time to jot it down, don't worry. All you have to do is go to Presbytery Western North Carolina webpage and look for the Guatemala Partnership section. And there's gonna be a huge kind of banner on the top of that screen that allows you to download our handbook to the partnership. We're in the process of updating that for 2023, but the information in there should still be current, relevant. And if you have any questions, there's contact information in that booklet as well. You're gonna to hear today from Pastor Kevin Frederick and Pastor Ellen Dozier, but since we're not gonna have a formal health report, I just wanted to share a few updates from the health projects. Year to date, we've installed 25 fan, um, stoves, sorry, yes, 25 fuel, fuel efficient stoves in Sur Occidente and have 25 more under construction thanks to our partnerships down there. The need for these fuel efficient stoves far outweighs the support we've been able to offer. Our partners in Guatemala have said that they could easily install two to three times that should there be support to do so. We know that health committees in both of our sister presbyteries, Sur Occidente and Suchi de Peques, are working to revamp their health promoter program. They are gonna be doing this by making sure that every church in our presbyteries down there, we have 11 in Suchi and 23 in Sur, have two health promoters who receive capacity trainings and are able to provide resources for their churches, basic first aid, ability to check blood pressure, blood sugar levels, and things like that. Sur Occidente is really prioritizing children's health this year because there was a lot of um, acknowledgement during the pandemic that children were really suffering. And a lot of the children in our sister churches were not meeting their developmental milestones. There was undernourishment. There were just children who were suffering from parasites and other things. So the focus this coming year is gonna be on children's health. We are working to send funds to buy scales for every single church so that they can be monitoring the weight and also height of every child. And there will be follow-up support for those families whose children are not meeting those nutritional or growth development milestones. Right now, every church in Sur and many of the churches in Suchi are providing antiparasitic treatment twice a year for the children, which has been a blessing. Suchi, in the meantime, because their church communities are more rural, rural, are continuing to prioritize their baskets with food and essential hygiene projects. You see here in the picture, some of the brothers and sisters from the executive committee and health committees distributing items in a local community. They use that chance to the opportunity to share food, but also some education about washing hands and masking and all of those things, those prevention measures, as well as just connecting them to health resources as well. So that's just a, in a snapshot, some of the things that are happening in the health world in Guatemala. Now I wanna jump into our trip from May, 2022. This was such a special time for all of us because it has been over two years since we've been able to formally travel to Guatemala and just hug our brothers and sisters. We reconnected in lots of different ways in this trip and you see some of the pictures, you see some of our partners from SOAR up on the top, you see some round table discussions with Suchi down on the bottom. And you'll notice that they are waving their hands. They are actually waving to each of you. They said they wanted to make sure that people in North Carolina could see that they're thinking about them and saying hello. A few of the ways we reconnected during this eight day trip was we shared fellowship meals at the National Seminary in San Felipe Retalo. We had round table discussions. As you see, that's not necessarily a round table, but we'll call it a round table discussion. We visited eight church communities when we consider the churches I visited, as well as Pastor Kevin, Pastor Ellen, and Pastor Linda Abel from Hayesville. We had partnership conversations with grassroots organizations. You're going to hear a bit about that from the others who are sharing today. And we visited three partner schools. You'll hear Ellen Dozier talk about her experiences in the school. And then Pastor Linda and Abel and I had the pleasure to go visit Puertas Abiertas up in Santiago in the Lake region. So we really were blessed to travel around different regions of our sister presbyteries and connect with people that we've missed so very much. Pastor Kevin Frederick is just gonna take a moment to share with you some of the exciting work that happened on the ground in Guatemala while we were there. Men in the Mirror is a 13 session curriculum that focuses on the relationship skills of men, 
and particularly how they are impacting their family life, uh, both their spouses and their children. And it is looking at the relational skills at work in the Gospels, particularly in the life of Jesus, but also in other parts of Scripture throughout the Bible. And it challenges men to learn from Christ and adopt those skills. Um, there were five new initiatives that came out of my work uh, in Guatemala and in uh, Nicaragua this, this particular trip. In Guatemala, in our sister presbyteries, um, in a few minutes I'll be speaking, or in a moment I'll be speaking about the Adegua trip uh, and, and the contact there, and Ellen will, will also be working about that, uh, talking about that. But also we were able to make contact, as you see on the left side, uh, with the chaplain of the um, the National Police Force. There are 70 chaplains there, and the academy is very interested in using our curriculum to train their chaplains because those chaplains are often the first ones to be on the scene of a domestic violence uh, situation in Guatemala and very, very uh, stressful and troubling situations. So they are open and are interested in us training with them. The most exciting thing, as I mentioned, is in with ADEGUA, the partnership with the microcredit loan program. And we are just this week uh, ready to launch our efforts to combine Men in the Mirror with uh, ADEGUA in our sister church, Arcadena Way, in, um, in the Sur Occidente Presbytery. And we are hoping to... Uh, we are starting that this coming week and we'll be training with the educational materials this fall and following through um, with our partnership with microcredit loans. Um, I'll turn it over now. There are other things that happen, but I'll turn it over now to uh, Ellen. Um, when it started, it was a real joy for me to be in Guatemala and to reconnect with people in the microloan project and the education work. In this slide, you see um, some of the work that the microloan group is doing. We are in the process, as Kevin said, of forming a new microloan group in the community of Morelia, which happens to be where Banner Elks Partner Church is. And that a new component of the, that project is going to be the uh, Men in the Mirror project. So we'll be working in that community, not only with the women, but also with their husbands and sons in an effort to help the families grow in love and, and justice and peace. I was able to visit um, in Morelia. You see this slide there of um, uh, the Adegua staff, and, and I'm there as well. Um, sharing some words of sharing some words oh. of greeting um, from all of you. Oh. <laughs> um, the the slide that's on the left hand corner is I'm in Guatemala City with the three Adegua staff people, Flora and Reina and Mildred. And I really like the slide because I think it reflects the joy of being together and of working together. And that really is so essential to the partnership. We had traveled to Guatemala City so that we could meet with the SEDEPCA staff who also work with women. And the two uh, organizations are trying to have some collaborative work together. And then I was able to visit two of the, the two public schools where for about nine years, we have shared books uh, with these schools, as well as providing workshops for the teachers so that they can uh, learn new ways of encouraging the children to really love reading and experience that. Every morning in the schools, they have 30 minutes of reading, and that could be either silent reading or the teacher reads to them, um, or they read a book and answer questions about it. Linda Abel and I went to the school in Santa Lucia and that they had this wonderful fiesta for us. You can see some pictures of that. They were thanking us for the books and for the workshops. And it was really overwhelming. Uh, the gifts they gave us, the words of thanks, but these were not gifts just for us. These were gifts and words of appreciation and thanks from the teachers, the administrators, the parents and the children 
for, for all of you, we really accepted uh, those, those words and gifts on your behalf. Now, I think these two parts of our partnership, the microloan and the education, particularly um, represent the body of Christ alive and at work on, in this earth, in this, on this world. I believe that we in this way are telling the story. And not only are we telling the story, but we are receiving new understandings of God's story from our brothers and sisters in Guatemala. Um, and all of this work is done across different languages, different cultures, and with distance from one another. And all of this work is done always relying on God's guidance. We had no idea how these programs were going to work out um, when we started. But every step of the way, we have tried to listen to the ways God is leading and directing us. And as we try, with God's help, to bring about a glimpse of the world that God longs for, for all God's people and for all of creation. You know, the gospel lesson for tomorrow reminds us that life is not found in bigger barns, but the life God wants for us is found in relationships, in bigger and wider and deeper relationships with God's people all around this world. Thank you. Thank you. So as you see, there were, th there were four of us on this trip and we spent some time together and then we all separated into our individual areas of work and ministry. And while Linda and Ellen were visiting sister churches and visiting schools, as the coordinator for the partnership here in Western North Carolina, one of my, my major jobs is to connect sister churches. And that's a challenge when you look at language barriers and even with technology, many of these communities have limited access so I want to share that I was able to travel into one of the most rural areas, which is Escuintla Suchitepecas. And this is where some of our churches here have sister churches. Iglesia Genesaret is on the left. And it was my great privilege to help them sign their covenant and renew a covenant that had lapsed. And then I was able to visit Iglesia Bethesda, sister church with Dallas, and, and really share and get involved with them now. Two pictures from each church doesn't even do this justice. You can see the balloons. You can see the celebrations. That particular church set off fireworks when I arrived. You saw in Ellen's picture her name on a banner. The welcome was truly red carpet, even though we were in some of the most rural areas of Guatemala. So I encourage you, if you have a sister church, look for ways to connect. And if you would like to travel down with us at a trip, I'll be sharing that information here in a moment. We have several churches in Guatemala who are seeking a sister church, but two I went to visit on the May trip. And you'll see this sweetheart of a little boy who gave me this flower. I couldn't bring it on a plane. So we agreed that I would take his picture and I would put it up in my home office so I could remember him since I couldn't bring the plant. And that's Iglesia Montesion in Sur Occidente. They're prayerfully hoping to be matched with the sister church here in the Presbytery, Western North Carolina. And Iglesia Jesus de la Agua Viva in Suchitepeques is also, this was a bonfire. The children are raising their hands and saying hello, and they also would love to be matched with the sister church. So if you feel that you would like to explore those conversations, please do reach out and let me know um, how I can support. So a couple upcoming trips and announcements. I'm gonna take a moment. You heard about the work that's happening with Men in the Mirror. You heard mention of Arca de Noé, and that was one of the communities I visited. I have as Ellen said, a relationship there with a gentleman that you'll see a picture of, that I consider my Guatemalan grandfather. And he was in a wheelchair. He could not get around. He broke his hip. So I took my shoes off and we walked 15 minutes through this muddy path so that I can see him. You'll see that picture. But I want you to see just an example of the power of a sister church relationship. One of the biggest misconceptions here in the Presbytery of Western North Carolina is it's a one-way partnership. We just give money and they, um, they simply use it up. And it's really not that at all. These are collaborative projects where the leadership comes from the churches there and that we work alongside. And I'm gonna ask our tech person to share this brief clip from Arca de Nueva Sister Church in Banner Elk. And Barbara Hosbein, who's a great ambassador of the program is sharing just a few updates and then we'll be closing out. About seven years ago, one of the elders of Arca de Noé paid us a visit. At lunch one day, our pastor asked Brother Selvin, what's the biggest obstacle to church growth? Brother Selvin replied that having a pastor who only came once a month 
was very difficult with a congregation with so many pastoral needs. I can tell you their elder, elders served the community with all their hearts and souls, but it was just if the, not if the audio doesn't improve, then we will take that off After and I will Sylvan send it to anyone who would like about a way to, to view it. So we'll give it about 10 seconds, see if it clears up. And if it we does not, then I would be happy to send this out to Western North Carolina Partnership Committee to fund a three year program to provide a full time pastor. In the Michael, first year, we're going to take that off and I'm going to share briefly year, that and I would love anyone who would like a copy of this video I'm more than happy to send it to you it's just a wonderful testimony um, so Barbara Hosbein was sharing with the sister church in Banner Elk how their church had invested in in Arca de Noe. and you see here brother Selvin who is an elementary school teacher in their church community and a couple years ago brother Selvin came to Banner Elk's church and said you know one thing that we really need is a full-time pastor and we just don't have the ability to do that right now. Now, Banner Elk said, you know, we aren't just going to do handouts and say not have a plan in action. Talk to us about your plan. So they did. And they discussed the ways they could do it. I cannot say this anywhere close um, to the way that Barbara shares it in that video. But essentially, the church began a social enterprise in partnership with some other people to create um, a little water business. Pure Water is a big business in Guatemala. And they are able to set up water pumps, give work to four um, men from the community. They bought a truck. They distribute that, have over 600 clients. And as a result of the investment of Banner Elk, 3,000, uh, sorry, uh, 3,000 for the first year, 2,000 for the second year, and 1,000 for the third year, they were able to build that water bills business and create sustainability for a full-time pastor position. So after three years of this pilot program, the sister church in Arca de Noe is no longer dependent on any other outside funds to pay a full-time pastor. They are able to sustain that thanks to the work of the congregation in the community, and they've completed many other projects as well. So if you would like a six to eight minute video clip of just to give some inspiration to your church as you look at ways to partner, I'm happy to send that along to you. And I regret that the audio quality was just not where we needed it to be today. So a few ways that you can engage, travel to Guatemala. We're, we're going down in December, December 1st. This is gonna be a small group because of just COVID still kind of rearing its head a little bit. So if you're interested, you're gonna reach out pwncguatemala at gmail.com. I have almost a full trip. So there are about four slots left. You can volunteer on a subcommittee. And if you want information for that, on that, feel free to reach out. You can join our partnerships leadership team. We prefer those who either travel to Guatemala or are interested in travel because the relationships is um, relationships are a big part of this. Serve as an ambassador, get connected to the work that we're doing and help us share the word in our PWNC churches. Contribute and finally contribute to partnerships uh, activities that you're passionate about. Get me the tongue tied. So contribute to those partnership activities. We do have another trip um, going down in February and that will be our joint partnership meeting after two years nearly of being apart all of our leadership will be joining together. I promised to show you a picture of Brother Francisco. This is my Guatemalan grandfather. And truly, we have spent many a days hiding under nylon tarps in the back of a pickup truck during rainy season, trying bumping down gravel roads to get church to church. And this gentleman who is well into his 80s, no matter where I am in Guatemala, even if it's not in his community, he will get in the back of a pickup truck just to see me to, to say hello and give me a hug. So since he was bed bound this last time, I was able to pick up some pollo campero, which is like the Kentucky fried chicken of Guatemala and take it to him in his home. And I believe that is the best part about connecting in Guatemala. It's not just about exchange of dollars or even exchange of ideas. It is truly the relationships that we build. So if you'd like to know how you can build those relationships at an individual church level, please reach out to us and we are happy to respond. Que Dios les bendiga. May God bless you. This concludes our report. Thank you, Marie and Kevin and Ellen. Um, we are grateful for your work. Um, folks who would like a copy of the video can let Marie know in the chat. And um, if anyone has further questions of the Guatemala Partnership, you can also reach out through the chat function. Um, at this time, I'm going to call on Sarah Grace Montgomery to uh, provide the report for the youth ministry program. Good morning, good to be with you all this morning. I'm going to share my screen so that you can see um, pages 53 to 56 of your 
docket just as I highlight some of what's happening from the youth committee. We're very excited to begin a new program year. And um, so I just wanna share with you what's coming up. Um, our first event is our youth rally and you'll see um, on the first page, you have all the events coming up, um, but I'll share this right here. Our youth rally um, will be October 2nd at Montreat and Upper Anderson. This is for middle school and high school youth. Um, a great afternoon to connect together. Um, this is a free event. It does not require a registration, um, but we do hope that you'll go ahead and get it put on your calendars as you're planning your youth ministry program year as well. Also in your packet, you'll see a list of folks who are a part of the youth council for this upcoming year. Our orientation's coming up and we're really excited to connect with these young people. But as you look at this list, I do hope that you will hold each of these young people, their congregations and their parents and families in your prayers, as well as the adults um, who participate as well. So you'll see all of that information on these pages of the packet. Um, and so I do hope that you'll look over those, especially and pass them on to folks who are planning youth ministry um, in your congregations. Another thing I'd like to highlight is um, some free resources that have been put out by the National Office for the Presbyterian Youth Triennium, which was um, originally planned to meet this year and was not able due to COVID um, and other uh, issues, we decided it was not gonna be the best thing to do, the denomination decided. So out of that, with the theme that was already set in place and all of the work that was already done, there are three incredible resources available on the Presbyterian Youth Trainium website that I just wanna draw your attention to. It's presbyterianyouthtrainium.org, super easy to find, three different full resources. Um, that are downloadable and have a wealth of information. So if you are in a church um, without a paid youth staff person um, with volunteers, these are great resources to just download and thumb through as you're planning some of your events. If you have an event coming up and you're trying to figure out um, recreation or the study, prayer and study or worship that you'd like to do. Um, again, I really just want to make sure everyone in our presbytery knows that these resources are available um, free for download. Um, they're worth looking through, thumbing through, and um, getting some ideas on those. I think we're going to stick that link in the chat box as well um, so you can go straight to that page. And so again, we're just looking forward to a great program year for uh, the youth for our presbytery. We hope that you'll look at those dates and those events coming up. Registration should be live on the presbytery website soon. Um, and that concludes my report. Thank you, Sarah Grace. Um, at this time, I'm going to call your attention to the written reports from the commissioners who attended General Assembly uh, this past month. Those are found on pages 67 to 71 of your packet. Um, we, General Counsel has asked one of our commissioners, Colin Caldwell, who is a ruling elder from Bryson City Presbyterian Church, to share his impressions of the meeting. And so at this time, I recognize Colin. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, when Cam had asked me if I would be interested and being a commissioner to this 225th General Assembly, I was beyond ecstatic. I had been a commissioner to the 224th in 2020, but due to the pandemic, that General, the, that general Assembly was very uh, abbreviated, and I was not able to fully enjoy the experience of General Assembly, the experience of going and being a part of the largest body of our connectional church. To fellowship with siblings from across the denomination and worship our God together. It's at General Assembly that we come together and decide what it means to be the PCUSA and determine how we present ourselves to the world as people living into the lively, joyous reality of the grace of God and fulfill our commissioning to be a people of energy, imagination, intelligence, and love. The theme for this General Assembly was from lament to hope. And as a body, we came together to lament the tragic events of the last few years. And we looked forward 
into the future with hope, knowing that nothing in life or in death can separate us from the love of our God in Jesus Christ, our Lord. I served on the Immigration Committee, a committee with one of the smallest slates of items before it, but these, but these items were not small in heart or effect. We heard from refugees and dreamers, immigration lawyers, and officials from throughout the denomination's offices and committees. We reviewed the history of the United States policies in relation to immigration and the PCUSA's relationship to immigrants. We discussed what it meant to be a people called to love our neighbor as ourselves. And we remembered that Christ himself was an immigrant in Egypt for a time when fleeing from Herod. And also as an indigenous person, I spoke up during committee and I attempted to uphold that no one is illegal on stolen land. Three of our four items passed in the consent agenda, including a resolution calling on legal experts, translators, and interpreters in our denomination to receive training in asylum law and to establish a network of attorneys to, to ensure the alleviation of the suffering of immigrants and people seeking asylum. The fourth item was pulled from the consent agenda, though it did later pass after being amended. That resolution declared the PCUSA to be a sanctuary an accompaniment church that encourages its congregations, mid-councils, and members to support immigrants, refugees, asylum seekers, and their children, and to resist efforts by the government to separate families. This General Assembly did a lot of good work continuing the PCUSA's long-standing example of social witness policy, enacting several measures that following Christ's charge to go and do likewise after the parable of the Good Samaritan, encourage us to be a good neighbor to each other and to take care of creation. And during one of the plenaries, stated clerk, Reverend Dr. J. Herbert Nelson, spoke of a need to shake up the world, and that is what we aim to do. Um, and throughout, several items were passed, which generated a lot of discussion, you can read more about those in my report if you would like. There's a big list of them. That is really long. And finally, um, the General Assembly decided to meet in Salt Lake City um, in a General Assembly that will consist of online committee meetings and in-person plenaries. I am forever I am forever grateful for the trust and opportunities that the Presbytery of Western North Carolina has given me in commissioning me to two sec consecutive GAs, and I look forward to future calls to the Presbytery of Western North Carolina service. And that completes my report. Thank you, Colin. We are glad you got to go to General Assembly and represent us. At this time, I'm going to call on Dwight Christenberry to make the report for the Committee on Preparation for Ministry. Thank you, moderator. Uh, I draw your attention to the uh, report of the CPM, page 45 of the packet. Uh, you will see there a single recommendation concerning Brandon Davis, uh, a candidate currently under care of the Presbytery of Western North Carolina. Um, and this recommendation requires a three-fourths uh, affirmative vote for passage. Uh, so on behalf of the CPM, I move that pursuant to the provisions of the Book of Order, paragraph G20610, the Committee on Preparation for Ministry recommends that Brandon Davis's period of candidacy be concluded as of this meeting of Presbytery, July 30th, July 30, 2022, in order that he may be free to receive and accept a call. And again, a three-fourths uh, affirmative vote is required. This uh, motion comes to us from committee and no second is required and the motion is before you on your screen. And I call on Dwight to briefly explain the rationale of the CPM. Thank you. 
Um, the Book of Order in paragraph G20602 requires that inquirers and candidates fulfill a year each of uh, periods of inquiry and candidacy. A bit farther down, uh, paragraph G20610 states that, quote, when a presbytery concludes that there are good and sufficient reasons for accommodations to the particular circumstances of an individual seeking ordination, it may by a three-fourths vote waive any of the requirements for ordination in section G206. A full account of the reasons for any waiver or alternate means to it ascertain readiness shall be included in the minutes of the presbytery and communicated to the presbytery to which an inquirer or candidate may be transferred, end quote. Uh, our CPM believes that such good and sufficient reasons for an accommodation in Brandon Davis's case are as follows. Uh, several years before Brandon enrolled in seminary, Arborddale Presbyterian Church hired him as their director of youth ministry. Uh, with the understanding that as a church employee, he would not be able to join the church. Eventually, after serving six years in that position and discerning a call to ordain ministry, Brandon applied to and enrolled at Columbia Theological Seminary. He stepped down from his staff position at the church and became a member of Arborddale uh, Church in order to formally begin the ordination process. The result, however, was that Brandon's enrollment as an inquirer under care of the presbytery was delayed, and this in turn delayed his enrollment as a candidate until October of last year. Uh, in the meantime, Brandon has graduated from Columbia Seminary and, and has completed all of the requirements for ordination of both the PCUSA and the Presbytery of Western North Carolina. Uh, so in light of this and the fact that Brandon's entry into the formal inquiry and candidacy process was delayed by circumstances beyond his control, uh, the CPM believes that no purpose is served by requiring him to wait out the remainder of the one-year period of candidacy. Uh, we therefore ask the Presbytery to approve this accommodation as stated in our recommendation. Thank you, Dwight. Um, I ask the body if there are questions for clarification or anyone wanting to speak in opposition to this recommendation. Hearing no questions and no objection, I assume we are ready to proceed. Is there any objection to adopting this recommendation from CPM. Hearing and seeing none, I declare it adopted. Uh, thank you and uh, Dwight, you may continue. Thank you. Um, um, I just draw your attention to two pieces of information um, also on page 45 of the report. Um, Jill Kimbrell, a member of the Belmont Pres First Presbyterian Church, was enrolled as an inquirer on May 18th, 2022. Um, and uh, you, uh, the Presbytery, have uh, just uh, ratified the, uh, uh, action, the other action uh, certifying uh, Brandon Davis uh, of Ar Arborddale Presbyterian Church uh, ready to receive a call uh, also on May 18th. Um, uh, moderator, this concludes the report of the CPM. Thank you, Dwight, and thank you to the CPM for its good work. Um, at this time, I call on James Taylor to present the report for the Committee on Ministry. Thank you, Madam Moderator. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, family of God. Certainly good to be with you all this morning. and What a wonderful meeting we've had so far. And I'm just so grateful for all of you and all the work that you do and your faithfulness to God's call to care and love uh, this world that we live in. Uh, let me draw your attention to the COM report on page 27 through 31 of the packet, where there are several recommendations for action as well as a rationale for each. Uh, Madam moderator, on behalf of COM, I move recommendation one on page 27 regarding the increase in terms of call for 2023. I, don't know if that's gonna appear on the screen or not. And there it comes. 
uh, that in 2023, the Presbytery of Western North Carolina minimum effective salary be increased by 4.3% to $36,762.50, re representing 57% of the 2023 medium and B median. And in 2023, Presbytery recommends that its congregations consider at least a 4.3% increase in effective salary for all other ministers. Uh, this recommendation comes to us from a committee. Um, no second is needed. At this time, I'll ask if there are any questions to which Jim might respond. Um, and ask if anyone wants to speak to the motion. I assume we are, okay, so I see a question. Um, Jim, it says, is the minimum for only full-time? I believe, I believe that's correct. Cam may want to correct that, uh, but this pertains to full-time. That, that is correct. It pertains to full-time and uh, any variations would be assumed, uh, the assumption would be they would be prorated. Yeah. Seeing no other questions and hearing nothing else, I assume we are ready to proceed. Is there any objection to adopting this recommendation? Hearing and seeing none, I declare the uh, motion is adopted by common consent. Thank you. Uh, Madam Moderator, on behalf of COM, I recommend move recommendation of item two on page 28, which says pursuant to Presbyterian North Carolina policy on transitional pastor becoming installed pastor, that the congregation of Bryson City Presbyterian Church be allowed to call Elizabeth Newman as the installed pastor with a designated term of two years this requires a three-fourths vote of presbytery. Thank you, Jim. I note that this um, the motion is before you, and it's also um, in attachment one on pages 32 FF of the packet. Um, this comes from a committee. No second is needed. Are there any questions to which Jim might respond? or if there's anyone who wishes to speak to the motion. Hearing and seeing none, I assume you are ready to proceed. And so I ask, is there any objection to adopting this recommendation? Hearing and seeing no objection, I declare the motion adopted by common consent. And we celebrate with Beth and with Bryson City. Absolutely, that's wonderful. Thank you, thank you so much. Uh, just a couple more, so hang in there with me. Uh, Madam moderator, on behalf of COM, I move recommendation number three on page 28. Hopefully that'll come up on the screen here. Uh, the validated or validation of ministry uh, for the following ministers. Let's see it come up here in a second. There we go. For Reverend Joe Bennett, for Reverend Ryan Brakemeyer, for Reverend John Campbell, and Reverend Daniel Tipton. This comes from our Validated Ministries Committee through COM. Is there any objection to adopting this recommendation? <clears throat> Hearing and seeing none, I declare the motion adopted by uh, the uh, common consent, the recommendation. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Uh, Madam Moderator, on behalf of COM, I move recommendation four on page 28 through 29. This is amendments for section four of the policy regarding transitional to installed pastor. And I will only just note that the words in italics are to be added and words in brackets and strike through to be deleted. This comes to us from committee and no second is needed. Um, it, I know it's a little hard to see on the screen where the italicized language is, but again, it's on page um, 28 of your packet, should you wish to see it more clearly. Are there any questions about this recommendation to which Jim might respond? What's the rationale for making this recommendation? Let me find that for you, hang on. Jim, while you're looking for that, I'll be glad to speak briefly. Yeah, to go it. ahead. Uh, the, uh, when the policy was originally established, uh, it, it assumed that uh, when, if a person were approved, as we just approved Beth Newman to be uh, called by congregation from a transitional position to an installed position, that is always for a designated term of two years, after which uh, it is possible for it to become uh, installation for an indefinite term. The question has arisen as we've had practice with the policy of whether a second installation is actually necessary. And in, in practice, in most cases, that has seemed uh, terribly redundant and um, kind of puzzling to a congregation who had already installed the person as their pastor. So this modification of the policy is simply intended to that if all the parties agree uh, that the designated term should be extended to an indefinite term at the end of that two years, that the installation simply be noted um, administratively by the COM that it has that it has taken place. So that's 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 a substantive rationale for the change. Thank you, Cam. That's uh, listed on uh, page 29, actually, that rationale. Uh, and that's pretty much what what Cam said. Are there any other questions or concerns? I assume we are ready to proceed. Is there any objection to adopting this recommendation? Hearing and seeing none, I declare the recommendation to be adopted. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Madam Moderator, we'll continue uh, by introducing our two newest members to the Presbytery in the following videos. Hi, Presbytery of Western North Carolina. My name's Richard Floyd, and it's good to be with you today. I'm looking forward to my time in ministry at First Church Hickory and with all of you. And I'm so grateful for the hospitality you've already shown me as I've been working my way through this time of discernment. I've met with the examinations committee and they asked me to respond to one of the questions here with you all. So the question they put before me asks about images of the church found in the book of Ephesians and then again in the confession of 1967 and the second Helvetic confession. I think the image of the church as the body of Christ found in Ephesians is a powerful reminder that we bring different gifts and abilities, but are hopefully united in purpose and direction. I have an interest in ecology, so I sometimes extend the body imagery to think of the church as an ecosystem. Many diverse participants in that system giving and taking Mike, energy in different ways. Delay that until but we it's can the, get the audio cleared up. Thank you. Madam Moderator, let's wait a minute and see if Mike is able to clear up the audio for us um, and he'll let us know if and when he can. That was Richard, Richard Floyd, by the way. Yeah, we need to mute 
mute the live stream. Done. Done. Yeah, Richard. That's Richard Floyd. He's going to be pastor at Hickory first. And uh, the one that follows will be Megan Hi, McMillan, who's going to, who is pastor at Mills River. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to see those. Presbytery of Why Western North Carolina. My name. Might this be another opportunity to? It's Richard Floyd. Uh, Michael says good to audio be with you is not today. working. I suggest I'm I looking both, uh, both, both Richard and Megan McMillan are in the meeting. So uh, if they don't mind, they don't have to go through the whole drill. But if we could ask, if we could ask for uh, Richard first to just uh, unmute himself and address briefly the uh, body about his coming call to. First Church Hickory, and then after that, if Megan would unmute herself and say a word about her call to Mills River. Great. Good morning, everyone. I think it's still morning. Uh, it's great to be with you. Sorry that the video wasn't, I wasn't sure if I was the only one who could not hear the sound, so I hope that you all were uh, riveted by what I was saying, and I was the only one who couldn't hear it, but uh, sorry that didn't work out. Um, uh, I'm very excited to be starting a time of ministry uh, in Hickory, North Carolina, and being in ministry with you all. Um, I'm in the middle of a whole host of transitions right now. I'm coming from Trinity Presbyterian in Atlanta, and actually tomorrow's my last Sunday in that congregation. So I'm in the midst of lots of goodbyes and lots of transition, but it's all good. And uh, I'm excited to turn my heart and mind and imagination to uh, to Hickory and to the work of this presbytery. So it's wonderful to meet you all, and I'm Glad to be in ministry with you. Thank you, Richard. That was riveting. So thank you. Thank you. We look forward to having you here and being working with you a little closer. Uh, Megan, are you available? Would you like to unmute yourself and, and just tell us? Sure. There thank you, you Jen. There you go. <laughs> Um, I'm Megan McMillan, and I'm coming to you from the Presbytery of Tampa Bay, where I was the associate pastor at First Presbyterian Church in St. Petersburg. I'm so excited to start my ministry with Mills River Presbyterian Church and in this wonderful presbytery. Um, I grew up in Columbia, South Carolina, and I came to these mountains over and over again as I was growing up. So I'm very excited to be in these mountains and in ministry with you all and starting my time at Mills River Presbyterian Church. I've been there for um, about a month now, and it has been a wonderful and warm welcome, and they are an incredible congregation. So I'm very excited to be with them and with you all. Wonderful. Thank you, Megan. We're delighted to have both Megan and Richard join us in ministry here in Presbytery of Western North Carolina. Let me just uh, call your attention to the other items of information on the report on pages 29 through 31, and I'm certainly happy to respond to any questions from the body. Are there any questions of Jim or the work of the Committee on Ministry? All right. And Madam Moderator, this concludes the COM report. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Jim. And uh, thank you to Richard and Megan. We um, welcome you to our presbytery. At this time, I call on Byron Wade for his report. Well, good morning, everybody. It's your General Presbyter, Byron Wade. I hope that all of you are doing well and keeping yourselves out of the heat, so to speak. I'm liking it, but I know some people don't. But anyway, I hope that your summer is going well. I just have a few things for you. And if you're following, my report is on page 65 and 66 of your packet. I'm just going to say a few things just to reiterate some of the things that are in that report. I have a few other things I have for you this morning and the, the time that I have. Uh, as you heard earlier, as we had the opportunity to celebrate the ministry of Billy Robinson, our associate presbyter, we were having some staff changes here at the presbytery. Not only Billy, 
uh, who has now left us, but also will be a member at large here in the Presbytery. Uh, Charles Davenport, one of our Presbytery Associates, will be leaving at the end of August, as well at the end of this year, Barbara Ross will be leaving us. I hope that you have the opportunity to, if you see them in person, I want to send them a note just to congratulate them on their work here within the Presbytery. And I also want to give a special thanks to Barbara because Barbara and I have had the opportunity to split the duties of especially Billy's work until the end of the year. And so those positions will not be filled, but we will look at what happens at the beginning of this year and prepare for that as we go forth. So continue to keep the staff of the Presbytery in your prayers. I do want to say uh, thank you and congratulations to each one of our administrative and program staff persons. They are doing a wonderful job here on your behalf here in this Presbytery. Also, many of you have been following, hopefully, our revisioning task force. Our revisioning task force that started last year or earlier this year is still continuing their work as we look at a new design for the Presbytery. Many times when we see situations like this or experience a restructuring, people think, you know, we're just changing seats on the Titanic. Well, number one, we're not on the Titanic. The Titanic has already sunk. We're, I just came from California. The Queen Mary is there and the Queen Mary is sitting there and people have a chance to visit. But we are an active boat. We are an active ship as we're moving out. And so I want you to keep that in mind that we are following what God is calling us to do as times are changing here within the life of the world, but also within the life of the church and the presbytery. So we are looking forward to what God is going to be doing. So stay tuned for more information from our revisioning task force. I also do want to let you know, as we continue our work for the care of our pastors and pastoral leaders, I've had the opportunity to speak to a few members of our presbytery so far, specifically George and Beverly Thompson, as well as a friend of mine who is a therapist or a coach over in the Netherlands, who was a president church USA minister. I've been doing videos with them and you will see them uh, come up hopefully within the next month or so, because one of my goals has always been to how can we provide support, especially times were rough before COVID, but as we're going through COVID and coming out, not coming out, still continuing with COVID, how can we support our, support our pastoral leaders, those who are burnt out, those who are trying to minister in these new times? And so my goal has always been to provide each person access to a spiritual director, a therapist, or a coach that will help them. So you will hear more about that as it goes along. But really, out of all the other things that I have within my report, the one thing I do want to let you know is how do we let people know who is the Presbytery of West North Carolina? Now, many of your churches and many of your members are involved in the Presbytery, but there are many churches and members who may not know what, who the Presbytery is and what it does. And I think that's very important that we always state our purpose of who we are and where we're going. But most importantly, who is God calling us to be? We ask that question. We've asked that question with our revisioning task force. But we also want to ask you the question, who are we as a presbytery and who is God calling us to be as we go forth? One of the projects I'll be working on in the near future is doing a series of videos and a, a series of other, providing some other resources to let people know who we are and what we're doing and what we're about. We do a lot of things in this presbytery. We have the church leadership school that trains uh, members of our congregations who want to know about theology and want to share and participate in leadership. We have missions with Guatemala and Malawi. We do trainings for churches, whether it's mission study or PNCs or, or press or nominating committees. We do a lot here within this presbytery, but I want you to know exactly what we do and where God is moving us as we go forth. So I would love for you to at least send me a note, drop me an email, Invite me to lunch. It's free. It's on me. You don't have to worry about the lunch. So we could have these discussions and talk about where is God leading us as we go forth. So I want you to keep that in mind as we go forth as well and look forward to the resources that will be provided. The last thing I want to let you know that I'm very excited about is that our staff will have a staff retreat in September. And so we're looking forward to doing that. We haven't had one of those in a while. But one of the things that we're going to be doing, we're going to be informing the staff also what's going on with our revisioning task force but also we're going to be talking about communication basic communication how we communicate not only amongst ourselves but also how we communicate you know with the wider body here within the presbytery so keep us in your prayers as we do that 
We're looking forward to what God is doing in a great way here within the Presbyterian of Western North Carolina. I'm appreciative of being your leader. October 1st will be two years, y'all. So you put up with me for two years. It's happy you haven't even seen me for two years. But I do want to say that I'm very happy to be here. I look forward to getting to know you. Congratulations to Megan uh, and to Richard, who is entering our presbytery. I look forward to seeing and being in your churches. And also, you know, I'm also on the preaching circuit. So if you want me to come and preach for me or do Bible studies, whatever the case may be, you know, I'm available as well. So I want to thank you very much for listening to me for these few minutes. And moderated, this ends my report. Thank you, Byron. We are so grateful for your leadership and your vision and all the uh, work that you are doing to improve our Presbytery. Thank you. At this time, I'm going to call on Keith Thompson, the pastor of Brevard Davidson River Presbyterian Church, and he will lead us in our prayers of intercession. Grace and greetings to everybody. Our presbytery does a good job of letting us know about prayer concerns, but what a privilege to pray together. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. God of a grace we cannot earn or deserve, we give thanks for the promise that you are with us, that you hear our prayers and know our needs, and that you bring hope to the hopeless through Jesus Christ. We ask your help today with the mounting fears that diminish our days and dampen hopes. We pray that you will turn our fear for a troubled world to faith, the trust that you are still in charge. We read the headlines, we see the images as day by day violence reigns and distrust grows. Help us to trust you in the midst of that and to entrust this boring world to your grace. May that better way of living you made so clear in Christ make its way even into the hardest of hearts. We pray for the church at all its levels and in every location. Make of us instruments of your peace. May we bear witness to your truth and stand in unity under the cross of Jesus Christ. With one voice, may we proclaim his lordship and spread his love as the conscience of a world. From this meeting of the Presbytery of Western North Carolina to missionaries around the world, we pray that you would bless the church with faith in a fearful world. We pray as well for those who are suffering with health concerns, Pam Bruner and many others. Take away, we pray, our fears about our health or the well-being of our loved ones. May those who suffer be granted faith in the face of fear and comfort in the knowledge that you hurt with us. Bring healing and hope in the sure and certain promise that not even sickness can separate us from your love. We thank you, Lord, for those brothers and sisters from this presbytery who have received their reward, even the salvation of their souls. And we stop now to thank you for each of them. Darian Ra Daria Reagan, Tommy Sneed, Barbara and jo Jean Witherspoon, Harold Nayanda, Robert Gruber, Jack Crusoe, and Phil Dumphy. For all in them that was good and lasting and redemptive, we give thanks. And for those who grieve, may our fears too be turned to faith. That in the midst of loss and loneliness, may all who grieve trust that our loved ones are safe in your care. And that by your power, we will one day see them again. Meanwhile, we pray, Lord, that you would help us to live this day and this week centered in your grace, facing whatever fears we must with faith, and loving and forgiving to your greater glory, and trusting always in Jesus Christ, the Lord of the church, and the risen Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, Keith. We have come to the end of our approved docket for the meeting. And I ask if there's any objection to us adjourning the meeting. And hearing none, I will adjourn with a benediction that is a prayer from the Book of Common Worship. God of our lives, by the power of your Holy Spirit, we have been drawn together by one baptism into one faith, serving one Lord and Savior. Do not let us tear away from one another through division or hard argument, but may your peace embrace our differences, preserving us in unity as one body of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we are adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Look forward to seeing you in person in October. Thank you. Recording Thank you, stopped. Thank you, Sarah. Yes. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks to everyone. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a fantastic. Hello,